On this edition of Great Lakes Now, the Great Lakes Island Basketball Tournament. We only have four boys in the high school team. The girls play their game and then come play an extra quarter with the boys. The divers on the front lines of the fight against zebra mussels. Whenever we're in the power plants, uh, a lot of the structures are 100% covered with uh, an inch thick of zebra mussels. And preparations begin for a new lock at the Sioux. 11 million Americans depend on that lock operating. Three to five million Mexicans and Canadians. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com slash foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome to Great Lakes Now. There are more than 30,000 islands in the Great Lakes. Of course, not all of them are inhabited, but some are home to enough year-round residents to have high schools and high school basketball teams. So who's your crosstown rival when you live on an island? It could be another island team hundreds of miles away. They're the familiar sounds of high school basketball. But in just a few hours, this gym will hold an event you've probably never heard of, the Great Lakes Islands Basketball Tournament. The Great Lakes Island Basketball Tournament is unique because, you know, it's just the island, small island schools. Um, and it's like the battle of the best of who's the best of the Great Lakes. Facing off are boys and girls teams from four island high schools representing three states. There's the Putin Bay Panthers from Ohio's South Bass Island. The Washington Island Bucks hailing from Wisconsin. And representing Michigan, the Mackinac Island Lakers. And the Beaver Island Islanders. It's fun mainly because Beaver Island is our rival and we've always been rivals. We have a lot of friends there. And then Putin Bay and Washington Island, we just have friends there and it's kind of fun when they come up here. This year's tournament, held on Mackinac Island, promises stiff competition on the court. But for the teams, just getting there is a challenge all its own. For the Putin Bay Panthers, the trip north from Lake Erie began the day before. Well, first we took a ferry from uh, Putin Bay over to Catawba Island. Then from there we drove all the way up through Michigan, across the bridge. We were in the car for nine, ten hours, plus a couple of stops for food. And uh, now we're on a ferry on our way to Mackinac from there. All right, Putin Bay! Head to the street, take a right! Get With no cars allowed on the island and only two horse-drawn carriages in service, the Panthers decide to make the icy walk from the dock right to the tournament. A couple of miles to the north, atop the island's iconic bluff, teams from Beaver Island arrive by plane. We took off on the plane. Gorgeous flight. We got to fly over the Mackinac Bridge, which is always a great thing to see. When the student's horse-drawn ride doesn't show up, they too have to make the snowy trek to the tournament. Finally, after more than eight hours of driving and a hotel stay, the Washington Island Bucks reach Mackinac Island. For junior guard Max Johnson, on his first trip to Mackinac, the island is a sight to behold. It looks like the Wizard of Oz or something like that, one of those fantasy towns, because you see all the buildings right up next to each other, different colors everywhere too. And then they've got that massive Christmas tree in the middle of the road, Christmas lights everywhere, so it's really beautiful around here. Even the hometown Mackinac Lakers have an unusual commute to the tournament. As you can see outside, there's a lot of snow and not as many people. We drive snowmobiles to and from school and anywhere else we'd like to go. Yeah. 
Now in its second year, the two-day round-robin tournament gives these small island teams an opportunity to play against schools of similar size. It's really awesome because we're playing against other teams who are just like us. Usually when we're playing other teams in Wisconsin, all the teams are like, they only have like eight players, let's run it on them, let's run it on them, and let's get them tired out right away. All the teams competing have fewer than 100 students enrolled in their entire school, kindergarten through 12th grade. The whole freshman class, is there are seven students. I'm the only girl and there are six guys. They're a little crazy and wild, but they're like brothers. That often means to field a basketball team, junior high schoolers are moved up to varsity, or teams might even play with a co-ed roster. Our boys team, unfortunately, uh, due to a player not coming out, we only have four boys in the high school team. And the girls play, play their game and then come play an extra quarter with the boys. Our team normally plays either Christian school, varsity schools, which are small in enrollment, or uh, public schools, freshman teams. Um, it's nice to compete against schools that are kind of playing who they have, not who they want to have. And also, too, the kids have camaraderie. They have shared experiences, which makes this game special. The tournament brings sharp shooting from behind the arc. Tough play from the low post. And heart-pounding nail biters. While friendly rivalries play out on the court. Off the court, players from different schools bond over some of the unique challenges of island life as a teenager. So a bad thing about this island is that if you're a teenager, you can't like anyone here because that just is really gonna go bad for you because if you date and break up, you, you're gonna have to survive with each other for years to come. And then, and then like you can't date anyone off the island because you'll never see them. I think it's just fun like, to meet new people. My school is very quiet, very small. So talking to other people who share the like, same situation as you is a lot of fun. I think we can relate with each other a lot just because we live on an island and know how hard it is to travel and do other things like that. Traveling to and from the islands for sporting events also poses a challenge for each of the four school districts. All of our travel expenses goes pretty much to the sports teams. It's um, you know something that we have to budget for every year because last year, for instance, we went to Beaver Island twice in one season. We went for basketball and soccer, so it adds up when you're sending 20 to 30 kids to a different island on a plane. It adds up. But for the schools, sports boosters, and parents, the experience is worth paying for. Sports are very important at our school, and it's kind of, if you don't play sports, then you're gonna be bored. All the community comes to every single basketball game, and our school is very supportive of our sports programs. I've known most of these kids when they were born. So you get very attached to all of them and you want them to do well and you want them to succeed. When the final buzzers sound, the Beaver Island boys and the Putin Bay girls both repeat as tournament champions. We were really hyped because we won it last year. We won all three games, which is how you win the tournament. We were like, yeah, yeah, let's go. And so we were, we were really excited about doing that. It was a long trek and we made it worth it goes in our trophy case at school and we get to hold it and touch it as much as we want. <laughs> For the teams that fell short, next year's tournament means a trip to a different island and another shot at the Great Lakes Islands title. Hey, I mean, our tournament next year is in Putten Bay and if they beat us on our home turf, we're gonna beat them on their home turf. <laughs> For more on Great Lakes Islands and the Great Lakes Islands Basketball Tournament, visit greatlakesnow.org. You already know that zebra mussels and quagga mussels are invasive species that can cause big problems around the Great Lakes. After their population exploded in the 80s and 90s, invasive mussels were enveloping docks, seawalls, sunken cars, and adhering to any type of hard service they could find. So now, it takes some old-fashioned elbow grease to keep them at bay. Today, we introduce you to one team that developed the right tools for the job. 
is freezing cold. You stay in the water for four or five hours on certain tasks. You gotta deal with current. There's a lot of different things that the divers actually go through in a day. And it can be, it can be as mentally challenging as it is physically challenging for them. Your mind can really wander when you're in pitch black for hours and hours on end. Some of the most skilled construction jobs around our region are performed in the Great Lakes, underwater by teams of commercial divers. Keith Meir is the president of Commercial Diving and Marine Services near Port Huron, Michigan. His divers are called upon to perform a variety of tasks. They're not just a diver, they're also pipe fitters, construction workers, iron workers, carpenters, pile drivers, you name it. They're, they're a jack of all trades. Today, they're measuring the thickness on a retaining wall to see if it needs replacing. But before they can do that, they have to clean a layer of invasive mollusks off the wall. In order for us to do our job, a lot of times we have to remove the muscles in order to, you know, get to what we need to work on. Uh, whenever we're in the power plants, uh, a lot of the structures are 100% covered with uh, an inch thick of zebra mussels. You can't even see them. Over the years, Keith and his team developed a pretty effective method of removing the invasive mussels, what they call zebra blasting. Carl, you ready for the blaster? Yep. What it does is it just, it just obliterates the muscles. They just turn into little tiny fragments and then the, uh, the algae and everything, it strips it right away. It gets into the places that the scrubber can't get. You know, it's two and a half feet across, so all the little nooks and crannies, it's either that or you gotta scrape them by hand, so okay. we use that whenever we can. You go ahead and start up the blaster. Today we'll be using the scrubber to actually scrub flat walls, get zebra muscles off. Yeah, anytime you're ready on that one, Carl. I'm just following diver one on what he's doing right now. He's cleaning the outside of the pans. Diver two's just sort of looking him, uh, over his shoulder right now, just trying to follow what he's doing, but the uh, visibility's pretty poor. How's that looking, Ted? Looking good on yours. Looks like we've got one more sheet after this one to do, and that's far enough. All right, you're there. All right. Each time a tender, the person keeping watch from the deck, provides a tool to the diver, it's part of an efficient mechanical process. The divers will have water blasters, high pressure pressure washers underwater, and they'll clean all the bars off. When they clean the bars off, the muscles fall to the bottom. They're, they're negative buoyant, so they lay on the bottom. And then we'll go in with a hydraulic scrubber. It's a double wheeled scrubber, and it's got steel brushes on it. And the divers can ride those up and down the walls, and they can go back and forth. And then we go back in with hand scrapers or water blasters again and get all the corners and pipelines and whatever else is in the water intake. And then we go in with a hydraulic submersible pump and the divers will actually suck all the, the mud muscle sticks out of the bottom of the intake. And then we send it to a machine that we've developed, we call it a mud separator. It will actually separate the zebra mussels and the mud and the sticks from the water. All of the equipment they're using has been entirely customized to help one of their biggest clients power plants. Power plants keep Keith and his divers pretty occupied. Their submerged cooling water intakes can pull in up to half a million gallons of water per minute if thousands of zebra mussels haven't parked right in the middle of the action. Now these are very common species here. Matt Shackelford studies zebra mussels for Detroit Energy Company DTE. It's a problem they've been dealing with since the late 80s when zebra mussels first hitched a ride to the Great Lakes through ballast water. Ballast water is used to balance the ship on its voyage across the ocean. And once it gets to the location to let off its cargo, it releases that ballast water. That ballast water is full of organisms. And in the 1980s, it was full of zebra mussel larvae, which quickly colonized the Great Lakes. When zebra mussels first came into the Great Lakes, we were already doing maintenance and power plants, and our divers started noticing that the steel structures or the, the concrete walls, they started having a, like a sandpaper feel to them. And upon closer inspection, we started noticing that these were juvenile zebra mussels. And throughout the next couple of years, there was just a, an explosion of the zebra mussels. My predecessors here at the company immediately started to notice them. And they were attaching to everything, not just power plant intakes, but drinking water intakes. It became a huge issue for any industry that uses water. 
when DTE wanted Keith's divers to get rid of the mussels, the commercial diving team had to improvise. We would take a fire hose and hook it on our backs, on our, on our tank on our back, with a little nozzle pointing straight behind us, turn the fire hose on, press the diver against the wall, and he would just sit there with a hand scraper and just scrape all day long. Then we got into the hydraulics of running scrubbers and then water blasters. And now we've advanced to the point where we're just in and out that quick and cleaning these muscles out. If zebra mussel levels are allowed to spike too high, they can block the cooling water intakes, forcing an unscheduled shutdown and slowing electricity production. The removal of zebra mussels now is just integrated into our preventative maintenance programs for all of our units at our power plants. And at that time, commercial divers are called in to do their thing, and they remove all the muscles while that unit's down. There's been a lot of people have tried different chemicals and different methods to clean or to uh, deter the growth of, of muscles. But the mechanical means is still necessary because when you start using a chemical in the water, you can't put that chemical into an open waterway where the fish are living. Researchers at the power plant tested what they call a coupon, a piece of sheet metal coated with a chemical compound. The coupon was added to a water sample in order to find out how zebra mussels would react. Eventually, the compound would break down and the zebra mussels would colonize, or just the expense of coating and recoating equipment, it was really more cost effective to our customers to have commercial divers come in and mechanically remove them. We got enough clean on that, Carl. We can go ahead and uh, switch over to the scrubber. As long as zebra mussels are in the Great Lakes, power plants will likely depend on the zebra blasting method to keep the lights on. Yet the day in, day out work of commercial divers remains mostly out of view. Coming down, Carl. Right here. We are very invisible. You'll see millwrights running around, you'll see pipe fitters, you'll see iron workers running around, and then you got four or five divers cruising around in a little tiny building, going into places that people don't believe people even go. You don't see anything for two, three hours. All you see is just black water and a few bubbles. And but the diver down there doing his job, keeping a plant going. To learn more about zebra mussels and where they cause problems, visit us at greatlakesnow.org. Every year, an estimated 500,000 visitors come to the Sioux Locks to see freighters move between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. But the locks are more than a tourist attraction. They're a vital link in Great Lakes shipping routes, and this winter, they're about to get a major facelift. Of all the Great Lakes ports, the busiest by far is Duluth. 35 million short tons of cargo, mostly iron ore, coal, and grain, depart that port every year. The coal and iron ore go mainly to smelters in the lower Great Lakes, and the grain mostly goes overseas. During its journey, practically all the cargo that leaves Duluth goes through the Sioux Locks on the St. Mary's River. Of course, it wasn't always this way. The St. Mary's River drops 21 feet over rapids on its way from Lake Superior to Lake Huron. Ships couldn't pass, so cargo had to be unloaded and carried around the rapids. The process was slow, too slow for the industrial age. Kevin Sprague is the Sioux Locks area engineer. As the mining started to open up in the, the Western Arab Peninsula, uh, you know, the copper mines and the Keweenaw, iron ore mines in the Marquette area, and then iron discoveries in, in the Mesabi Range in Minnesota. Uh, the need for a more efficient mode of transportation became apparent. The first ship size lock was completed in 1855, meaning ships could bypass the rapids and be lifted or lowered as they moved from one lake to another. More and larger locks were added over the next hundred years. As more and more high-quality coal and iron ore moved through the lakes, it shaped the development of the region. The industrial might of the Rust Belt was built on cargo that moved through the Sioux Locks. Jim Weekly is president of the Lake Carriers Association, which represents 13 shipping companies with U.S. flagged vessels on the lakes. 
So the whole reason that the steel making capacity is concentrated in the Great Lakes region of North America is because of our ability to move cargo efficiently, economically, and in an environmentally friendly way. The most important lock today is the Po, completed in 1896 and then expanded in 1968. At 1,200 feet long, 110 feet wide, and 32 feet deep, it's the only lock that can handle a fully loaded modern freighter. That means 90% of the cargo in the Great Lakes can only move through this single lock. As area engineer, Kevin Sprague oversees all operations at the Sioux. About 100% of the iron ore mined in the United States flows through this facility. And uh, that's really critical for the uh, integrated steel mills on the Great Lakes, the, the blast furnaces. And th those create the advanced high strength steel for the auto industry, so the, the auto bodies, um, that kind of thing. And, and also for the appliance industry and others. So it really affects the entire North American economy. So the US, Canadian, and Mexican uh, economies are affected. If you look at just the Sioux locks alone, 11 million Americans depend on that lock operating three to five million Mexicans and Canadians. So it's not just a, a national treasure, it's a North American treasure. So if the Poe is out of service for six months, and this is a Department of Homeland Security statistic, 11 million Americans will become un unemployed, three to five million Canadians and Mexicans will be unemployed, and the layoffs will start within a matter of weeks. With three national economies in the balance, keeping the Po functioning is a top priority for the Army Corps of Engineers. And that means winter, when ships aren't moving, is actually the busiest season at the locks, despite the extreme conditions. We have a 10-week outage every year, but that 10-week outage takes place between January 15th and March 25th, and so it's about the coldest time of year here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and, and we have a very tight schedule, so we try to take and fit these projects, these big maintenance projects, into about an eight-week time frame, and, and it, it's tight. Right now, the massive PO has been drained for critical maintenance work. Behind me is a miter gate, and so miter gates are, are uh, in, in this case, the, these each, each leaf weighs 220 tons. There's a substantial amount of cracking. Uh, we're doing a lot of repairs on the upstream gates and we're adding stiffener plates. We've gone through a complete uh, electrical rehab, replaced everything electrical on the pole lock. We've replaced, it's all new control systems. We also have a crew that's doing uh, a clean out of the underfloor uh, drainage system. For decades, winter at the Sioux Locks has meant racing against the clock to get this crucial facility ready to play its role in the region's and the continent's economy. But soon, the locks will enter a new era in their history. In December of 2019, funding was approved for a long-anticipated upgrade to the Sioux Locks, including the construction of a new lock as big as the Po. Andre Saruk is overseeing the billion-dollar construction project. The plan is to, to build a twin sister to the Polak, which w requires completely excavating the existing Sabin lock and almost starting from new in its place. Uh, the advantage of using the Sabin lock is there's a lot of material already gone. That, you know, there, there is a chamber there, so it'll be just crushing some concrete and removing some more uh, earth. But for freighters to get in and out of the new lock, the river will have to be deepened. In the past, that's been done by blasting out bedrock with explosives, but that can cause problems. For one, it'll be a lot of seismic issues underneath the International Highway Bridge. Uh, so there's uh, all kinds of regulations and stipulations of using a blasting technique next to a bridge, you know, that relies on those sound footings uh, to keep the bridge in place. So the, the, the mechanical option, if all goes well, will be a, a safer option for everybody involved. The project will take at least seven years and funding will have to be appropriated annually to move it toward completion. By the time it's all over, the price tag is predicted to be nearly a billion dollars. This is extremely exciting. This is, this is one of the, the, the biggest things our small town of Sault Ste. Marie has seen in, you know, 50 years since the construction of the Polak. I'm thrilled to be part of it. I, I can't explain how excited I am to be part of this team and, and part of this project. Thanks for watching. 
Finally, an announcement. You might have seen our documentary, Beneath the Surface, about Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline that runs through our region. Line 5 carries 23 million gallons of oil and natural gas liquids every day, and it's the center of one of the biggest conflicts in the Great Lakes, especially the section that runs four and a half miles under the Straits of Mackinac. Line 5's origins date back to 1950 when a pipeline was built from the oil fields of Western Canada to the shores of Lake Superior and eventually through Michigan. It was completed in 1953, and now the Detroit Historical Society is sharing photos, blueprints, and contracts from the construction of the pipeline. Visit greatlakesnow.org slash line5archive for more. And for more about our stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brook B. Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you.